Thanks, Bob. My name is Theron, and I am an alcoholic. And uh, he's right, I started out with Akron. I was taking fiddle lessons down the street from the Akron intergroup office. And I had about two or three years of sobriety, so I knew everything at that point. And I thought, oh, I see the intergroup office sign there. I'll go in and see if there's anything that I can give them the benefit of my insights on. And I walked in and they said, you know, we've got an archives in the back if you're interested in history. Oh, really? And the archivist is here. Would you like to get a tour? Sure. So I went in there and I had at work as, as a chemist, I'd been working a little bit on one of, uh, one of the projects I was working on had to do with uh, deacidification of books. And the project was being sponsored by the Library of Congress. So I went in in order to impress Gail because here's this good looking young blonde woman, you know, like, yeah, I know all about book deacidification. She goes, really? And it was all downhill from there. So anyway, I, I moved from Akron to Michigan and there I, I didn't get involved in archives for a while until um, the area decided that they needed to start an archives committee. We did not have an archives committee. We had no repository. And there was a, uh, I guess, a pack rat who had been keeping records of all the, the area minutes and that sort of thing because he'd been on the mailing list for him. So he just kept everything that was mailed to him, like unlike most of us who throw it in the bin, uh, throw it out and get rid of it. He just kept it over the years. So we asked him if, if we could copy all this, the uh, airy minutes that he had because uh, we didn't have any of our own records. And he said, sure, yeah, yeah, no problem. So he loaned us box after box after box of these things. And um, at that point, I was asked to be the, the uh, archives chairperson. And I thought, I better learn something about scanning and classification. I'd learned about conservation some years before, Bob W. and, uh, and Gail, and I, but I didn't know anything about actually setting up an archives. So I started doing some research on what does a professional archivist do, and it was rapidly clear that I was in way over my head. Because professional archivists, you know, I mean, they have four-year degrees and they, they get into lots of detail. So I tried to boil it all down into what's the really basic essentials that we probably need to know. And having done that, um, I wanted to pass that along. This is kind of the distillation uh, after I got past the confusion stage, mostly. Uh, of what I learned and what I went through in, in setting up the archives for Area 32. Um, so that's why I call it Taming Archival Collections. It's going to be about uh, description, classification, and then we'll get into digitizing archives. So, okay. Um, anybody here ever receive a box full of all kinds of random stuff? Okay. Some old timer says, "I want to, my wife's after me to clean out the basement." Or I remember my uh, my sponsor had been a delegate and a trustee, and he decided it was time to clean out his stuff. He gave me boxes that look like this. So, what do we do with this stuff? Well, there's going to be probably several natural collections in that box. You sit down at the at the kitchen table or in your repository, and, and you start pulling stuff out and they fall into several piles just kind of naturally. Well, here's personal correspondence, here's the area minutes, uh, here's some, um, something that uh, the GSO sent to him. So we start out by, uh, first of all, getting a deed of gift so we have ownership of it, and then start making piles. Um, these natural collections then will kind of determine how we deal with them. For example, the box, boxes from my, uh, my sponsor, who had been a delegate and a trustee, <coughs> some of it was area minutes. We already had area minutes, and they were just photocopies, and they were duplicates of things. So those I could deaccession. That's easy to take care of. Other things were his personal correspondence to people that he knew around the country. Okay, that's 
personal delegate correspondence. Other things were um, stuff that GSO had sent to him having to do with the General Service Conference. Okay, that might be another separate collection. So we classify these things and then describe what each one, each item is. <clears throat> Anybody here have a finding aid for their archives? You got one? Great. Sort of an index, uh, a written list of everything that you've got. That's the idea of of doing the description and the evaluation and using, we're, we'll get into the Dublin core system for naming and classifying. So then we evaluate what this stuff is. Does it need preservation? Does it need conservation? Probably most of the things that we have, the documents and whatnot, just need to be put into safekeeping somewhere in a acid-free folder, acid-free boxes, organized and put away. Uh, the conservation stuff that we've talked about this morning and a little bit uh, in the earlier session this afternoon, that's for special cases and that's, that doesn't occupy a lot of our time. And then we record what we've got and put it into our index, our finding aid or you know, whatever you want to call it so we can find things. The, the area that I was in in Michigan and the area that I'm in now, the finding aid was the archivist. Is like, you want to know something? Sure, ask me. <laughs> um, that's in one of these boxes, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, I remember that. And maybe he was right, and maybe we just searched for several hours through the boxes. So the idea of a finding aid is to know what you've got, where it is, and what it pertains to. Uh, the Dublin Core metadata is a set of 15 descriptors. And it was d agreed upon by a bunch of archivists and librarians that got together in a meeting in Dublin, Ohio. It's not from Dublin, Ireland. And like I say, there's 15 descriptors. Metadata is just information about what you've got. It's information about information, basically. So metadata for uh, a document or um, an article that you've got in your, in your archives might be the title of the document, who created the document, who you got it from, uh, the date, does it relate to any other holdings. Uh, for example, my sponsor had gotten a copy of a book from GSO that was uh, that was never published. It was written as a follow-up to on AA history, but it was never published. So he got a copy of that, so we scanned it. Then there was also correspondence relating to that book. So one of the fields in the Dublin Core is, what does this entry relate to? Well, these relate to each other, and I can say that this letter from GSO to this delegate relates to this book. Um, there are some, hey, how'd you do that? <laughs> it's a miracle. Hey. You know, what, what am I using to change the now? You can use these. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Yeah. All right, Justin. Uh, back. No, just stay. Just stay. <laughs> So, as I was saying, who's the contributor? Um, what area does this pertain to? Like, is this uh, only for Area 32? Or, uh, or what's the date range? Is it maybe area minutes for uh, 1950? Uh, a description of what the th what's in this. The format, is it a document, is it a digital file, is it a tape recording? The identifier, somebody talked about having a, just a unique sequential number or maybe it's your file folder and box location, just some number that's unique to this particular item. Language is pretty obvious. Publisher, if it's the area of minutes, the publisher is the area. Relation, we talked about. The rights. Um, 
these things are fairly self-explanatory, I think. And in the handout, there's a link to uh, the Dublin Core website. So if anybody's interested in following up on this. There are some additional descriptors that we might want to try adding to this because they're not alcoholics and there's some things that are important to us. So things like, is, this, is there an anonymity issue in this? Are there last names in this document, right? Any restrictions? Is this, somebody gave this to me and said, you can have it for the archives, but don't show it to anybody until after I'm dead, okay? <coughs> Conservation. Is there any repair work that needs to be done to this? Or have we already done repair work and we need to record that so we know what's been done? Then what we do is we put that information into our index, our finding aid, our whatever you want to call it, our inventory of what we've got. And uh, I think Vicki talked about she's got it on paper. Paper's fine. Spreadsheet is fine. There are archival databases if you want to get real fancy with it. But basically, it's, it's a sheet with columns, and at the top of each column, you put one of the descriptors. What collection is this from? What's the title? What's the subject? What's it relate to? What's the date? And then you just start going line by line. You enter each of your documents. Or in the case of at Area 32, when we were copying the, the area minutes, We'd copy them uh, by year. So we'd have uh, minutes for each month, but just put them all together into a packet for one year, and that's one line. Area minutes for 1972. Area minutes for 1973, rather than every page. Now, one of the things that we, we can add to this is keywords. And this is real important because how do you find things? Somebody would come to the, to the archives and say, you know, it seems to me there's people talking about changing the way we reimburse the delegate for his expenses. And that, there was some discussion about this, I don't know, five or ten years ago. And do you remember what, what was said? If we have one of these fields with keywords in it, like delegate expenses, then we can search it and turn that up. And even if I've got them clumped by a whole year's worth of minutes, that's way better than going through like 10 boxes of stuff. Because I can go through one year's worth of minutes pretty quickly. So here's a, a list of some ways to, to do this finding aid. Paper list, it's cheap. You can go down to the, to the office supply store and buy a ledger book. Um, it's easy to use. You don't have to train people too thoroughly on how to use paper and pencil. The drawbacks are it can be difficult to search. Even if you put keywords into it, you're going to have to scan down through the columns just looking for, no, no, that's not, no, that's not. It. An electronic spreadsheet takes you up one level. If you've got, if the archives has a computer, there's probably, you may have Microsoft Office on it, you've got Excel. There are free office suites, open office or Libra office where you, you can get the free spreadsheet. Or you can, if you've got a, an internet connection, you can go on to Google Docs, Google Documents and use their spreadsheet. Um, it's searchable then, which is a big advantage. Uh, they're easy to maintain. You can make copies of it. You make backups. Uh, it may require a little more training. If all your volunteers are old retirees <coughs> like me, some of us maybe aren't quite as techy as some others. If you get some young volunteers, you get some young sponsees in there, um, they probably are way ahead of us. Then finally, there's the electronic database. And there are several of them available. Some of them are free if you have server space to install them on and the all the software necessary to run a web server. Uh, some of them are available where they'll do the web hosting for you, uh, but those cost money. They're not only, they not only can be pretty expensive, they can get really complicated, and I think unnecessarily for our purposes, too deep. Uh, they got lots and lots of bells and whistles, 
and I don't know how to use all that stuff. I just want just a list. Which brings us to, if we're going to do this electronically, we want to make backups. Right? Whether it's on Google or you got it on Excel or whatever, make a backup. It's easy to copy a file. And that way, if you forget the password or somebody takes the computer home and, and, and loses it or whatever, you've got a copy. At least, you make at least two copies and one of them on different media, which means like put, put a copy on a thumb drive. You don't just make a copy on the same computer. If you've got your catalog on paper, you can still copy it. You can slap it down on a photocopier and make copies that way. Yes, sir. Do you have an external hard drive where the time machine backs up automatically? Yep. The, the comment is if you have an external hard drive with an automatic backup program like Time Machine, then it makes a continual backup automatically and that's that's a great thing. It's helpful uh, to take that hard drive <coughs> off-site. If you have two external hard drives and you can swap them out, I'll give you an example. My home pictures, my family photos, I keep on an external hard drive and I take it into the, the bank safe deposit box and I put it in there and then I have another one that's attached to the computer that's the continual update and periodically I switch them so I've always got one copy in the safe deposit box. So if my house burns down, I don't lose everything. I suggest you make friends with your website committee um, because if we have displays that are traveling and going around to um, state conferences, district meetings, whatever, we can also put some displays on the area website. Uh, ensuring that we don't <laughs> violate anonymity by showing pictures of, of members or last names. But this will help to increase the awareness that people have of the, of the archives and it'll get you more volunteers and more support when you go for a budget. Tell people what you want help with because somebody's going to get turned on and say, wow, old, old timer, interviewing old timers, that sounds like fun. It is fun. Or, boy, I really want to sit and remove staples all for hours. <laughs> there are people. There are, there, there are people. Now, digital archives. The way I got into digital archives was they said, we had no archives at all in Area 32. We got digital archives because it was all we could get. We, made, we scanned copies of the uh, the minutes and and the group histories that this pack rat had kept, um, and when I when he offered to let me scan them, I thought, okay, yeah, I'll make uh, make photocopies. But then I've got one sheet of paper with the same amount of exposure, <coughs> the same amount of work. I can run them through a scanner, and I can print copies if I want to or I can save the electronic copies and make copies of copies of copies and, and, and have a lot more secure and have backup. So we bought a scanner and there's basically two kinds. Wait for it, there it goes. Um, before we get into that, Bef before we, we, any, we make the decision to get into digital archives, we want to ask ourselves, why are we doing this? Is this serving our primary purpose? Um, is it supported by the group conscience? We went to the area and said, you know, this is what we got in mind, and the area voted on it. Um, is it aligned to our mission statement as an archives? There's definite disadvantages to having digital archives and we want to weigh that against what are the the reasons for going ahead with it and there's expense as with anything related to archives we can we can run up the tab so the goal was preservation of the records of the organization what it, what an archives does the most basic definition of an archives is it's the records of an organization so 
that was our goal. To act as a reference, to preserve our history, and, and to educate the members. So then we had to define the scope. If we already had paper files, do we want to scan all the paper files we've got? You know, in Area 58, we've got a repository that's jammed full of boxes of paper files. Is there any point to scanning all of that stuff? Probably not at this time. In Area 32, we didn't have anything. The only, the only holdings we were going to have was anything that we scanned. So yeah, we'll scan. Um, there's such a thing as a born digital um, document or item. Born digital would be um, something that was created on the computer and it might be uh, backups of your area website. Uh, it could be digital recordings. Um, it's anything that was that was never on paper to begin with. Our, uh, our area minutes are actually born digital. They're printed out and mailed to people, but they're actually born digital. Picture. Picture. Pictures. Email. Email. Yep. So all those things, why print them out and then file them when you can start accumulating the electronic copies and not have to worry about, uh, you know, sometimes the print, printed copies that we get of things have been photocopied several times and they're crappy. And, and besides, the digital versions are searchable. You can, you can search the content of a digital file if you're looking for specific information. Some of the pluses and minuses we came up with advantage to uh, digital archives doesn't require any space and doesn't um, have any conservation requirements uh, you don't have to remove staples from it or uh, do any repairs it's easy to retrieve and share uh, it's useful in making displays because you can print out nice color copies of things that look almost identical to the original and put them in your traveling displays and you don't have to expose the original documents to the risks of hauling them around your area. The possible downsides, there's going to be some cost. You'll probably need some new equipment. Probably need some training for people. This is not going to be something that most of your volunteers are going to be familiar with. And what I call continuity and rotation. So I set up a digital archives and I'm really into all this digital stuff and I get the electronic spreadsheets and databases and scanning and all that stuff going and then it's time for me to rotate out. So who's going to be the next person to come in and take over this? The Pardon? The Neo-Luddite. Yeah, yeah, the Neo-Luddite comes. <laughs> well, we don't need all this crap. So, do we have one of these guys available? <laughs> Everybody should have a computer geek around. Did you ask to put my picture on? <laughs> <laughs> That's Bob when he was a child. <laughs> he was about five at that point. So you need, a, obviously, you need, you need a computer and you need the scanning software to run the scanner. Um, we bought a, sh a, a sheet feed scanner to run the area minutes because it was piles and piles of paper and it was all pretty flat. So we just run it through the sheet feed and it would go shh, shh, shh. And it's great. Didn't take much time at all except I had to pull each sheet out of the plastic protector sleeves, which was tedious, and take staples out of some of them. But, you know, once that was done, they went pretty quickly. A flatbed scanner, however, some of the things that this pack rat had were like badges from meetings. This is, does not feed through a sheet feed scanner, believe me. So if you get a sheet feed scanner, you want one that's easy to open up and remove jams. You also want a flatbed scanner, but the good news is that a lot of computer printers are these all-in-one things where it's a, a printer and a fax and a scanner all together. So 
next printer you buy, if you don't have one like that already, next time you need a printer, think about a three-in-one. You need backup storage media. We talked about external hard drives, thumb drives, uh, maybe cloud storage. You need a secure storage location for your media. Okay, we don't need a repository building necessarily, but if we back everything up onto an external hard drive, where are we going to put that? Maybe into a safe deposit box, maybe you know, we take it home, it depends. It's up to the, the group conscience to figure that out. And as I said, tech capable staff. Um, the, the scanning software oftentimes will include OCR capability. OCR, for anybody that's not familiar, is optical character recognition. And what it means is that an image that has text on it, like if you scan your area minutes, is fed into your scanning software and it tries to read that Ordinarily, anything that you scan is turned into a picture. It's like you photograph the minutes. And so that's not text searchable. Optical character recognition tries to read that and turn it into text rather than a picture so that you can scan it for words. Now the reason we started putting keywords into our finding aid was we found that the OCR didn't work very well. It did not recognize text very well. And part of the reason for that is that our area minutes were old photocopies of old printouts from years and years ago, and they were hard for people to read. I mean, some of them were pretty vague and nasty. So the computer just couldn't recognize them. So we started putting in keywords. We'd look through the minutes for 1976 and say, ah, there's something about delegate expenses. Ah, there's something about... Um, relocating the area and, and here you know whatever whatever subject came up we'd put into our finding aid if you can get OCR to work it's a wonderful thing but it's pretty dodgy other things to kind of keep in mind is that if we scan everything, we have all these images electronically, it's real easy to make copies and send around and share them, and then we have the real potential for anonymity breaks. We also have potential copyright issues. Now, in the case of your area minutes, the copyright belongs to the area, so probably no issue with the area archives having a copy of those. With other things, if it's uh, personal letters from people, then we don't own the copyright. And Don will be talking about copyright issues tomorrow. I don't know enough about the subject to really speak intelligently on it now. The only thing is we need to know that to be careful how we handle things that we get from other people. Um, hardware security, file security, uh, who gets the passwords and does everybody have their own separate password so that if somebody goes back out we can revoke their password or somebody gets a resentment stomps out and tries to trash your files or something like that not that these things would ever happen um, crashes computer crashes hard drive crashes never happened to me <laughs> Um, Bob probably has yeah. experience with that. <laughs> so another reason for making multiple backups. Oh, there's a, there's a picture of the sheet feed scanner we bought. It was really nice and slick and it folded up into something the size of a loaf of bread. But it was expensive. Branding? Hmm? Branding? Branding? Oh, it was a snap scan. And, and I did a little research on the internet and said, snap scan? I hadn't heard of that. It wasn't, you know, Hewlett Packard or something like that. And, but got a lot of great reviews. I bought it and I found out that a friend of mine who runs a graphic design studio with like 30 people, he bought two of them and he loves them. 
and it worked great for us. So that's my experience is one of these worked great for us. Take that with a grain of salt. Is that kind of scans both sides at one time? Yep, scans both sides both sides simultaneously in color and you can set how much resolution you want. What we found is that for any <laughs> images, any photos, pictures, anything like that, you want at least 600 dots per inch. For text, 300 dots per inch is plenty. The more dots per inch, the bigger the file size. So if you scan a photo, would 1200 dots per inch be better? Sure, but it's not that much better and the file size is four times as big. And, and you can choke your computer pretty quickly. Yeah. The question's about lifespan on external hard drives, and we'll get to that in, there's a slide on that coming up in a minute or two. That is, that is a definite issue. So uh, there was a question about opt optical par character recognition that's in here. Um, scanners are often bundled with Adobe Acrobat, and Acrobat will do OCR, or it will try to do OCR, but in my experience, it doesn't work all that successfully. I went to the Ohio Historical Society and they were doing a scanning project on Civil War records and applying optical character recognition to that, to handwritten records from the Civil War. And they had massive computing power that would automatically adjust things to be straight and then read handwriting, and then they, they had lots of volunteers to go in and read it themselves and check whether the OCR was correct and type over it, and it was a huge project. But they had government grants. We don't have government grants. Was it successful? Um, they were doing pretty well, but it was largely because the volunteers were checking everything. I think they were graduate students, which are, you know, they're disposable. <laughs> um, software for splitting and merging PDF files is helpful. Did you know that you can edit a PDF file? You can take pages out of it, put pages in. There is software for that. Some of it's available free. Um, you'll want to have an image editor for your photos. I scanned a whole bunch of slides from our area and they were like 30 or 40 years old and they had all turned sort of a yellowish greenish color. Well, with image editing software, we, you can remove that yellowish cast and make them look a whole lot better. Maybe not perfect, not, not like new. Um, and my, the last bullet on here is open source versus proprietary software. Open source software is developed by a community of people who all contribute to it and it's free. Um, because it's free it does not come with technical support so you are your own technical support so there's positives and negatives to it. Proprietary software typically you can get some level of technical support. My personal experience with Microsoft technical support has not been great um, but it's something to keep in mind. The other difference between them is open source uses open document formats that are more likely to be valid over a longer period of time. Anybody have the experience with like uh, Microsoft Office where they give you an upgrade? Hey, you know, we got this upgrade at work and we're installing the new Microsoft Office and now it won't read your old files and it complains to you about the, the file format isn't valid anymore. That tends to not happen with open source stuff because of their, they use a different format. As I said, for documents, for print documents, you want 300 DPI or better and save them in PDF format. Uh, this is what's recommended by uh, the National Archives and the uh, Library of Congress. There is a special PDF format called PDF-A for archival. 
um, and it just it does not include some of the fancy bells and whistles that uh, the newer versions of PDF have. So it's a simpler format, and it's more likely to be um, universally, universally readable. For photos, again, the, the recommendations from the National Archives are that if you can save them in TIFF format or PNG, these are what are called lossless formats. Uh, JPEG, which is the, the format that you normally see photos saved in, is a compressed format where it loses information. So if you, if you were to open a JPEG and then save it again, not just close it, but if you open it, maybe do a little editing on it, save it again, open it and save it, it keeps losing more information each time it's resaved. And you'll see JPEGs uh, if, oftentimes on websites that have kind of a blotchy look to them. They look sort of pixelated. That's because of this compression. Now the difference is JPEGs, because of their compression, are going to be much smaller file sizes. TIFFs can be huge. So for a nice photograph, your JPEG may be 2 megabytes, 4 megabytes. A TIFF will be 20 or 30 megabytes. You've got to balance you know, how good does this need to be versus how much space do I have and how much, can, how much storage can I afford. Same thing for audio. There's lossless audio formats, like WAV is probably the most universally familiar one, and the lossy ones, MP3, uh, which is the most popular one. And MP3 is, again, a much smaller file size than a WAV file. Hard drives. Um, the failure rate of internal, internal, this isn't just external, but these are the really rock solid internal hard drives. Um, I looked up a whole bunch of different references on this and there wasn't a whole lot of agreement. There's a wide range of failure rates depending on who did the testing and who the manufacturer was. So the mean time between failures was two to three years. Did Tatri did the testing here? <laughs> yeah. It looks like it, doesn't it? <laughs> That's not very long. No. And some of you may be old enough to remember when you could count on a hard drive crashing pretty much annually when they were new. They're doing much better than that, but you shouldn't count on them being forever. A few years and it's time to make backups and make sure you got copies of everything because it, it sooner or later it's going to crash. So is that scale in years or percent? I couldn't quite read the size. Oh. Is that 0%, 2, 4, 5? That's percent. Okay. Seagates don't come out looking real good, do they? Yeah. Solid state hard drives, uh, the medium time before failure is cited as being two and a half million hours versus half a million hours for uh, regular mechanical hard drives. Um, they're, they're just tougher. They can stand more vibration and shock and that kind of thing. They're, they've been coming down in price a lot. They're still more expensive than the old spinning disk kind of hard drive, but they're a lot more practical than they were just a couple of years ago. You can still, though, if you're looking for really large capacity, you still got to go to the spinning disk kind of drive, the old style. And on hours, is that considered powered up or just hours period down? Pa powered up. Okay. Powered up. Thumb drives. It's basically the same technology as a solid state hard drive. So the failure rates are similar. So and, and those, again, have been getting larger and larger and cheaper and cheaper. So that can be a really good way to do a backup. I bought a thumb drive 
just a couple of weeks ago, it was 256 gigabytes, and it was, I don't know, 30 or 40 bucks. Um, just make sure you don't lose it. <laughs> Where did that go? Um, Most of them will take a lanyard. Like yeah, you can wear it around your neck. When I first started doing this, I... Uh, in, in Area 32, I copied all the, the our electronic archives onto a thumb drive, and I'd go to an area meeting and say, look, I got the whole archives right here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Theron. Um, CD-ROMs CD -ROMs, um, and, and DVDs don't hold that much data, and using them for backup gets really tedious because you got to keep feeding them in, feeding them in. Um, also, CD-ROMs that you burn on your computer may be difficult to read on somebody else's computer. I don't know if you've any of you run into that. Uh, they're slow. They're just, uh, they're not practical. They're not a good way to do this. Question for you. Uh, when is a good time uh, to use a thumb, thumb drive versus an external hard drive? Or do you recommend both or one or the other? Um, one of the backup rules is several different media. Okay, yeah. and and that's on that's on a slide that's coming up. The question was when to use a uh, thumb drive versus a uh, uh, external hard drive. Yes, sir. Uh, the newer computer models are doing away altogether with the CD and DVD. Yeah, and yeah. Another good reason not to use CDs is. Yeah. So they're they're like vinyl. You know, now. Yeah, yeah. My laptop doesn't have an optical drive on it. So here's the backup rule. Three, two, one. Three copies of anything that you care about. <laughs> two different formats. For example, you could put a backup onto a cloud server like Google Documents or uh, Dropbox or something like that. Um, and another copy on a USB stick or an external hard drive and at least one off-site backup. Sir? Uh, somebody told me that uh, Google owns everything. The ownership is uh, Oh, you mean as far as the content? No. No. No, that's, that's one, of those, um, one of those scare stories that goes around the internet. The other, the other one is that Facebook owns everything. No. Um, if, well, it's important in doing this that we have a documented procedure on how we're going to do the backups, how often, which one goes where, um, how we rotate them, if we've got one in the office and one in the safe deposit box or whatever because it can get complicated. Um, and you want to be able to pass this off on volunteers, right? You don't want to have to do this all yourself. So if you've got a written procedure, then you can say, here, you want to be an archivist? We'll start you out with making backup copies. It'd be a good experience for them. Little more on backups, backing up your laptop to an SD card in the same laptop is not a backup. Backing up a hard drive that is sitting on the tabletop six inches away from your computer is not a backup. Sorry. Backing up your Google Drive to another Google Drive account <laughs> is not a backup. Why is because if it, if it fails, if Google goes out of business, whatever. Uh, backing up your documents by copying them to another folder on the same computer is not a backup. How do you know that, you, that the copy you've made, anybody, anybody ever copy files and find out that the copy is corrupted, that it doesn't work, you can't open it? Aha. Uh -huh. How do you know that it's a valid copy? There, is, there are programs that will scan your copy 
and calculate what's called an MD5 checksum, which is just a, a long number that is characteristic of that file. There's a, 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 a what do you call it? There's a mathematical formula for calculating this thing. And if another file is different in any way from that, then the MD5 checksum will be different. So you do this for your original, you do this for your copy, compare the two checksums, and if they're identical, it's a, almost 100% certainty that the two files are identical. You've got a good copy. And there's free MD5 checksum utilities available for all operating systems. It's tedious, but it's the only way you're going to know for sure that your copies are valid. Now. Is there any way to set that up automatically? Yes. The question was, is there any way to set up the MD check five, uh, MD5 checksum checking automatically? Yes. Yeah, can be done. Um, now, as, as our files age, does anybody remember DBase? Anybody remember Lotus 1, 2, 3? I've got a neighbor that came to me the other day and he said, I, I wrote a novel that's 1,200 pages long and it's in Lotus format and I can't open it now. Ooh, sorry. Um, so we need to not only make backups, we need to update our file formats periodically. This is another good thing to have a written procedure for so that we know we're going to follow through on it. Might do it once a year, uh, once every two or three years whatever is appropriate to the particular file format. But we talked about Microsoft Office doc files. Now it doesn't like them very much. It likes docx files better. Um, the PDF file format was originally a, an Adobe proprietary format. They turned it over to the International Standards Organization in 2008. So it's now an international standard. So there's some hope that that will remain valid. Um, other long-term formats, these are open format standards, are the text, TIFF for uh, photographs, PNGs for photos or images, WAVE and FLAC for audio. So for cataloging, we talked about using a simple spreadsheet. Um, there are a couple of um, archival databases that are available. Archive Space was developed by a bunch of archivists and this is an open source, meaning it, the software is free. However, you have to install it on your own web server or hire a web server somewhere, which means having the uh, Apache and uh, uh, PHP and Linux and all that available and having somebody who knows how to do that. And then once you get it installed, it's pretty complicated to use. <laughs> it's, it's really nice. Um, the same thing with Omika. Uh, it's another open source archival database. These both have web front ends, so if you want to create a website for your, uh, your archives um, and create um, data entry forms that your volunteers can type information into and all that. They're really nice, but they're a lot more complicated. And you need that junior uh, Bob, the geek. So some, some reference resources. Um, our own government, archives.gov, has all kinds of great information. and they have information that's oriented towards um, personal users, which is re really more appropriate to us. They have information for professional archivists. If you've got the four-year degree and you understand all that stuff that they're talking about, that's great, go for it. But they have information that's available for like family collections and those kind of things that's more useful to uh, us. Uh, the digital preservation, 
program from the Library of Congress. The Northeast Document Conservation Center, that's, that um, group is primarily concerned with document, with document conservation and not so much with uh, digital archiving or cataloging and describing. But it, it's got a tremendous amount of information and downloadable pamphlets about all kinds of things. If you sat in the conservation uh, workshop this morning and you're thinking, boy, I'm never going to remember all that stuff when I get home. They have pamphlets on all of it, on deacidification and stringing up uh, pamphlets and that, everything that we went over. And what I found when I was in Michigan was I joined the State Historical Society and they were great. They had their own workshops and they shared information freely and provided a lot of support because a lot of those state archivists and state historians are in kind of a similar situation. You know, the guys with the County Historical Society and they've got a small house in a small town and it's the, the records of the early settlers of that small town and they're running on a shoestring budget and trying to use volunteers. So they're in, in a real similar situation. So I joined a historical society and it was, got a lot out of that. So something you might want to look into. And that's it. We've got about a minute left. <laughs> I'm happy to stay late. Um, but has anybody got any questions? Please use the mic. Wasn't there also a software program called Museum Arch or MuseArch or something? And, oh, yeah. And for like 20 bucks, you could get the super duper for archives? I use it. MuseArch. Muse there you go. S A R C. I use it. M U S A R C H. And if you Google that or just put a dot com after it. You should be able to find the stuff. It's not too complicated, not too great, but uh, good enough for our purposes. Yeah, there's several others too. If you do a Google search, you'll turn up some other systems as well. Yeah, Ted Alcoholic. Um, I have a question on uh, if we ever get to a point that where we're going to uh, different geographical areas using the same program maybe in a same collective site on a collective cloud or something like that are you at any point now to what recommending like MuseArch is what they recommended last year that when we can link to each other someday and you can find the stuff that I might have put um, are we on that path at all not to my knowledge okay but the one of the purposes of using the Dublin core descriptors is it all it's puts all our information into the same kind of format so that if we ever decide on standardizing on a particular archives database, we can suck it all in using the same kind of descriptors because they pretty much all recognize the Dublin Core. Um, I could say I, I took some stuff from MuseArch and, and uh, we got a grant at our historical society, something you folks don't have to worry about, which is about half the efforts of most of the archival community is getting grants. Um, but um, we got past perfect and we had an awful lot of information on MuseArch, but most of these things have some way to export most of the data and import it into the new software. So there are, there are hopes of, of not having to redo everything if you get a new system. Uh, my name is Lila, I'm an alcoholic, uh, Area 50 Archives Chair. Um, Spirit of Rotation has blocked like 90% of the efforts that I've tried to do for our archives for about five years now. And so um, inventory control and the way that that's being used, um, th is there anything that happens this weekend that really covers uh, how it is being used by the people that are attending this um, program this weekend? 
how what's being used? Uh, inventory control. If people are using um, electronics or if they're using paper systems or what it is that people are really using these days for smaller archives and uh, larger archives displays, of course. Um, by inventory control, you mean? Uh, you had different types listed, paper oh, or, right. uh, or just a um, sheet, a, a chart, just or like just a database. Like I, an index or a... I tried yeah. to move us to database and I almost got drowned um, because they, they really believe in the fact that spirit, in the spirit of being able to rotate out, we need to keep this in the most simplest form possible so that somebody with no electronic behavior whatsoever has the capacity to take it over. So is there anything here that, that uh, goes over how it is kept and what kind of inventory processes people are using? At all? I don't think we have a sense of what's in use generally. Um, I mean, my sense of it is that it's really scattered and not a lot of electronic listings um, and not a lot of paper listings. You know, I think there's a lot of archives that still just use the archivist as the inventory control. Oh, I know where that is. Sarah Bradburn, um, I'm an Area 92 archivist and an alcoholic. Um, I wanted to ask, being the neo Luddite in the group, I understand that digital digitizing can be great for minutes and that kind of thing, but really, this, you know, doesn't it take the heart out of this to just have a digital picture when you're... I, yep, I agree completely. If it's on loan from somebody and the only way you're going to get it is to take a picture of it and you'll never own the physical object, you work with what you got. But there are so many physical objects and the PRASA archives when they came to Spokane and I saved half the room for them, they weren't there. There was nothing there. There were eight panels. Nobody's told me that I needed to have a computer there. Not that we would have had one anyway. They weren't accessible on the computer as it turns out that year. So there were eight panels, and while they were interesting, they, there wasn't any heart to it. I, you know, I cut my teeth at the Akron Archives, and I think digital archives can be interesting and useful, but there was nothing like bringing out the first edition, first printing, signed by Bill and Bob, in pristine con condition, and Wow. And no, no digital representation of that is ever going to have that wow. You're right. I'd like to uh, thank Theron very much. Thank you. Thank you.